I'm Paul Tannenbaum, Director of Program Integration. For those of you whom I have not met, um, I have the honor, first of all, I have the sorrow to provide um, regrets from Dr. Moore, who was not able to be here today. Um, and lucky for me, that means that the honor and the pleasure falls to me of hosting and, and introducing um, Dr. Hrabowski. Uh, I have been, I was able to make all but one, I think, of the uh, speakers in this series, and I have found them absolutely fascinating and inspiring. And I can say from firsthand experience that having Dr. Hrabowski as our final presentation means we are definitely going to end with a bang. He's a phenomenal speaker, as I'm, as you're about to find out. Um, those of you who may not be familiar with Dr. Hrabowski and his accomplishments, uh, wow, they are a lot. Um, just as one indication, in 2012, he was named, I want to make sure I get this right because I'm a detail freak. Time Magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Just saying. Um, <laughs> He has, he has chaired various august panels, including committees for the National Academies. He was appointed by uh, President Obama to chair a panel on uh, STEM opportunities for minority students and so forth. Um, he has almost single-handedly um, transformed UMBC into the powerhouse research um, institution that it is today, a powerhouse in STEM. Um, with a particular uh, emphasis, indeed, on encouraging STEM for um, typically underrepresented um, minorities and, and women and so forth. So he has been an absolute uh, leader, uh, unquestioned leader in those initiatives uh, recognized worldwide. And um, as I shared with Dr. Hrabowski, um, I can provide a little bit of a personal perspective um, on all of this because not one, not two, but all three of my children uh, are alumni of UMBC uh, in the Herbowski era, so they made it out okay. Um, <laughs> made it out okay, and I, I say that because I, truth in advertising, I have to admit to you that they they were retrievers. They were not terrapins, as they should have been. Um, but I will, I will try to not hold that flaw against Dr. Hrabowski. Um, indeed, he goes a long way toward um, retrieving himself, no pun intended, in that regard, because he does have a bachelor's and an MA in mathematics. So obviously a, a wise and wonderful person. Um, at any rate, I, I'm... I think I will stop doing my blathering now uh, and get out of the way so that we can hear Dr. Hrabowski and uh, Thank welcome. Much. Thank you very Thank much you for very joining much. us. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe, great, it's on. So I'm going to ask my colleagues to move back there because I'm going to move up some and then I won't have to have my back to you in the spirit of innovation. The, uh, our campus is seen as being in the top five in academic innovation in the country um, with, interestingly, with Stanford, MIT, and um, uh, Arizona State, of course, and, and we're there. And, and I want to give you a sense of why and how that is the case. How many of you have been to my campus? How many of you have been to UMBC? Oh, good. Very good. Anybody who's a graduate of UMBC? Oh, you look really smart to me. You're really there. You're really there. I love that. I love that. The, um, I, am, I want someone to tell me why I decided to move to here rather than staying back here. Why did I do that? More personal interaction. Anybody else? To connect with the audience. Anyone else? Now, um, would it be fair to say that you're, you're a fairly risk-adverse group? What do you think? You think so? I think so because I think you're used to getting A's, and you get A's by being careful and not putting yourself out there until you know what you're talking about, right? Well, I, I purposely moved up for just those reasons. I like to think of it as a math problem. I wanted to minimize the distance between us and maximize the interaction. 
because now I can see your faces. You can see me. And if you, if you just think about it for a minute, this is a more intimate feel, more like a conversation than back there in a distance, right? Or if I were up there talking. Now, the president of Stanford had the chance to talk with college presidents at one of our conferences, and he asked this question. How, how long do you think a typical college student focuses in a lecture before fading out? What would you say? 12 minutes? 20? 15? I appreciate your guessing. It's eight minutes. After eight minutes, they begin to... Now, for... I'm, I'm assuming that many of you are in science areas. Um, what, what would the neuroscientists say, the people at NIH? How long can anyone, even well-educated adult, how long can that person concentrate, focus on what's saying, said before fading out? What do you think? 15. Anybody else? 10. 20 minutes maximum. Now, all of you are 20th century learners, and so even when you fade out, you know how to fake it and look at me like you're still in jail. <laughs> you're thinking about getting back to work. You're thinking about what you have to do tonight, what you can look like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh. but you're thinking about the thing. So I know I've got about 15 minutes, all right, to really talk. And I, I tell you that jokingly but seriously to say this, that um, at the university, at UMBC, and at many places now, we are understanding that to simply give the 50-minute lecture and have it only as lecture is, is not effective in the teaching and learning process, that we need more opportunities for more engagement of people. So in our, if you go to our CDC at UMBC, it's the Chemistry Discovery Center. It focuses on active learning in first and now even organic, um, involving groups of students one person's a project manager, one person would be a blogger, one person is a provocateur. They've got different roles, and we, we use problems out of the research park on campus, and that's over 100 biotech and IT companies. And so the problems become real. Nobody can sit back and be cool. And the challenge in a lecture at a university is people have a way of doing all kinds of other things using the technology. For years, as you know, uh, in faculty senates around the country, people were saying, should we allow people to have their iPhones out? Okay, should they, should they be allowed to use a computer while somebody's trying to lecture? Now, we try to engage them with the technology more and more in classes. Whether it is in a linguistics class or a digital humanities class or a writing class or a STEM class. Now, doesn't mean you don't have lecture, but it is to understand how the brain works. We're just beginning in the spirit of innovation to use what we know from neuroscience. My colleague is here, and I want you to know him, Carl Steiner is somewhere. Carl Steiner, Carl is the vice president for research. He's an engineer. Give him a round of applause, would you? Yeah. Here's what I want you to think about. The more, as a society, the more we understand how we think about things, the language that we use, the way we interact with each other will determine not only who we are as individuals, but who we are as a society. And so I want to talk about what we've done at UMBC to rethink who we are and how we do business, but to broaden it beyond my campus to thinking about the concept of innovation itself. The, our campus is, a, is perhaps so high achieving because we have students from over 100 countries. Uh, when I asked the freshmen and uh, new students this fall to stand. I said, how many of you have either, uh, either from another country or were born in another country and came here, or you have a parent, one parent from another country? It was almost half, almost half. Uh, and if I said this earlier today, if it were not for people coming from other countries throughout the 20th century, we would not be the most powerful country in the world. There's no doubt about that. All you need to do is look at the Baltimore Washington Corridor, which has the largest percentage of PhDs in the country in STEM areas. And you look at where they went to undergrad school, and you see a large number came from other places to come into undergrad school. Or when they were born here, their parents came here to grad school. Now, why am I telling you that? Um, if you look at the Nobel laureates in the 20th century, you will see that a disproportionately large number had a parent who moved to this country 
and often they lived in New York. They went to the Poor Men's Harvard City College or Brooklyn College, and they went on and got the Nobel Prize. Why? Hunger, intensity, and appreciation of what it means to be in this country and American and able to get an education without being wealthy, and it made all the difference in the world. We've been through a 50-year experiment in our country since the 60s. Um, before that time, the majority of families never thought their kids would get an education, a college education. Uh, let me ask a question. How many of you in this room are either first in your family or first generation college? Let me see your hands. And that's probably 40%. That's, it means it's a very privileged uh, a group. Um, what percent of Americans do you think in the 60s had graduated from college? What do you think? I heard 20%. You really are risk adverse, I can tell you. <laughs> and I'm pushing you. Why, why am I pushing you to, and why am I not simply giving you the fact? Why is it that I'm asking you these questions? So you can what? So you can pay attention. Yeah, that's good. I like that. I like that. But also so it can force you to really think about it, right? Because if I just give you the answer, it'll just go right by you. But if you have to think about, well, how would I answer that? What do I really think? Now, people like Wes Bush will have me come and talk to his top 300 uh, engineers, um, leaders, and I will be saying the same thing. They're very careful people. I mean, no, accustomed to getting A's, very structured, right? Not accustomed to a lot of risk. It, 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 there's no way to talk about innovation if we don't talk about creating a climate that allows people to take risks. If we're only doing that which is safe, Oh, good, you can. That's good. I like that. That's very good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Rest. Encourage them. That's a very good point. That's a, that is, so you don't really disagree with me. You just to take it to the next level. Because when you encourage them, you are allowing them, you see. All right? But you're absolutely, it's a stronger word. It is, to, I, I love that. And that's very good what you just did. All right? How dare you interrupt me like that? <laughs> no, you can do that. No, I'm purposely, because a part of innovation is being able to laugh. I mean, we take out stuff. You all remind me of my faculty colleagues. In the, in the faculty, the typical academic look is one of cynicism. <laughs> you don't laugh a lot. Even when I tell a joke in the faculty center, people go, mm, and I'm saying, get a life, folks, laugh, right? I mean, but it is in an environment where people can laugh comfortably and be a little silly sometimes and not take the linear path and interrupt and be willing to take risks because they've been not just allowed but encouraged to take risks, it's absolutely right, um, that we begin to get the crazy ideas and perhaps one of every 100 will be amazing, okay? This is the way we make progress in so many different disciplines. And so I want you to think about this. So again, I ask the question, what percent of Americans do you think had a college degree, I mean 25 and older, in 1965? Five, 10, anybody else? 20, okay? It's actually 10%. At that time, we broke everything into two groups, blacks and whites, okay? I can prove it. How many of you even remember black and white TV? This is a young group. I'm amazed because my students say, what do you mean black and white TV? TV's always been in color. No, it really was not. No, it really was not, all right? But the Census Bureau in the 60s didn't break it down by different racial groups. It just said black and white. All right. What percent of whites had a college degree in 1965 if 10% of all Americans did? Now, you know, if the average is 10, white folks are always the more advantaged group. Now, come on. You know that mathematically, right? So it's got to be more than 10, right? Only 11%. You know, you might think, what? Only 11%. And blacks, what do you think it was? Don't be embarrassed. Say it. Two. Two to three percent, right? Today we've got all the groups, we break it down, we disaggregate the data, and the reason we do is so we can see what goals we are trying to get to, how we, what we're doing. So what's the fastest growing group in our country? Hispanics. What percent today have a college degree of Hispanics? It's actually 14 percent. Okay, all right. And for whites, what do you think it is? 35, it's about 37. And for, uh, for blacks? It's actually 20, 20 percent. What is the highest achieving group in our country? You see how you look a little uncomfortable even saying it? 
You can't be innovative if you don't tell the truth of what you're really thinking. So what percent of Asians have a college degree? I heard an 80. Usually I get a 90 from somebody, all right? All right, what do you think it is? I heard somebody else. What? It is 55%, because many, my students, 25% of my students are of Asian descent, all types, whether it's Indian, Chinese, Korean, whatever. But a lot of them are kids who are, whose parents came here to grad school, and they remain. Now, let me ask you one more question that will put in perspective what we have as a country to, to think about. Um, and it's a question that will sound politically incorrect, which is a part of just being able to be out there. You say what you really think if you're going to really begin to examine what we think. The fact, the question is this. How many of you believe there are many more very high achieving Chinese and Indian children than American children? Many more. Many more. Absolutely. Now, often when I ask the question, people cringe because they don't want to talk about those things, and they are uncomfortable, and they even want to say, how do you keep your job saying things like that? Don't you believe in our children? Of course I believe in our children. Well, here's the fact. There are 1.3 billion Chinese in the world, 1.2 billion Indians in the world. You put those two together, you get 2.5 billion people. The top 10% of any population will be extraordinary. In achievement, right? What is 10% of 2.5 billion? Don't let me leave here saying you don't know any basic math. Because <laughs> I will talk about you. I really will. Except for my UMBC graduates. I know they know. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> What's 10% of 2.5 billion? 250 million. How many Americans are there in total? Yeah, yeah. No, early 300s. Maybe 320, something like that, right? But the point is, there are almost as many super high achievers from those two populations as, as there are Americans, okay? And why is that significant? If you look at the PhD programs in computer science, for example, whether UMBC or MIT, you'll see most of the kids come from those two countries. If you look at the majority of undergrads at MIT, you'll see the majority. If I'm saying almost half of my kids are from other countries, you'll see, and those two countries are leading the way, you'll see at MIT 70%, 80%. Now, what, what am I saying? I'm saying that two things. Number one, it's important to look at the statistics to understand where we are as a country, two, to understand the strengths. A part of those strengths are people coming from other places with all, all of that intensity that can make us even better. When I'm looking at innovation, I'm thinking about ways of having students who've been in this country for families for generations to understand just how hard other people work. Whether they're from China, India, or from the islands, I mean, the Caribbean kids tend to do better than African Americans. We know that. And it has on the Nigerian students because they've come from that, that intensity of getting to America. They're excited about the Russian kids who come here, do quite well. You know, what am I saying? That we need to look at our strengths as Americans coming from all over and then look at the question of education and innovation and to understand what are our attitudes about people going to college. So when you think about all those groups I just mentioned, what you will see is only a third of Americans today over the age of 25 even, have earned a college degree. And so what you've not thought about is that most American families have never had anyone, of, this is for all races, never had anyone graduate from college. Did you get that? Now when I say that, all of my friends say, Freeman, that couldn't be true. Uh, all of my friends graduated from college. Duh. I mean, um, duh, right? Lawyers, no lawyers. You know, professionals here, no professionals here, whether it's in STEM areas or whatever, physicians, no accountants, no accountants, plumbers who make more money than most of you all, no plumbers, all right? So it just depends on the person's background. The other thing that, in terms of innovation, that we're finally understanding in this country is sometimes it's better for a student to go the route of getting a two-year degree. Biotech, in the biotech industry, I chaired this committee for the National Academies. We need some PhDs in some areas and some grad degrees. We are really hurting when it comes to people with the two-year degrees in biotechnology. Um, in fact, when you think about innovation, whether it's about UMBC or in general in, in higher education, it will not simply be the degrees that people are looking for. I think the IT world leads this. More and more, they're looking at competencies and certificates and badges. So we have a training company in Howard County. You can go to that training company, do a cybersecurity boot camp coming out of high school. In 18 months, you get that certificate. You can start off at $65,000. 
without ever having a bachelor's degree. Some of our students who are college students who are getting bachelors also will go and get those certificates because it verifies particular skills that they have that different companies are looking for. We are the leading producer of students who go to NSA, for example. We've got now 1,100 of our graduates at NSA, but there are large numbers of students who come in, who came in this freshman year, who quite frankly already have security clearances and already are working in cybersecurity. And I was just saying earlier, my biggest job is to get in and say not to hire my 17 and 18 year olds full time as professionals. Because if you do, it's really hard for them to finish that degree. Okay, so they will work 15, 20 hours at NSA. So the line I give to new parents is this. You've got uh, your kids have spies all around them. All right, and they're watching your kids all the time. And the parents go, yeah, let them know they got people watching them because they don't know who they are. And everybody's concerned about behavior of young people. But the fact is that innovation will mean more partnering with companies, with agencies. And I don't think anybody is more enlightened, I I'll say it again, than the intelligence community, especially NSA, because they get the point that kids can do some great math, great computing, even great in languages much earlier than 21 or 22. And uh, I had the privilege of comparing what we do in America with children, with other countries, and I've done it for years with the International Math and Science Competition. You, when, we look at the, when you look at the International Math and Science, the Thames Report, the International Math and Science Competition, um, what, what country has the most confident children in the world? It's the US. Our students leave those exams, and you know what they say? We got this. And what country is the most confident and with the lowest scores in the bottom quarter of the world? We got this, all right? So our kids may not know a lot, but they are very confident. I want you to know <laughs> They are on it. We got this. I mean, they will tell you you're wrong in a heartbeat, all right? It's very interesting. Other countries are very humble. You know, we bring, they, we've been bringing Chinese kids over years just to teach them how to disagree with the teacher. They would never do what he just did, what Paul just did, to, to disagree. Because, I mean, you, you know, I'll put a differential equations problem on the board, and I'll start solving it, and I'll look at the group, and I'll say, um, is this right? And they'll go, mm -hmm, because the professor said it. Kid comes in who's a freshman, knows algebra, comes in and says, that's wrong. He did not know what he's talking about, but he still said, that's wrong, Doc, in a heartbeat. But that is one of our strengths, though. Let me say that. The creativity that our students have. That sense of self is a strength. Now what we have to do is to teach them to know something in addition to being confident. You, get it. That's a, you know your own kids, right? But we, we've got that, that, that independence, that creativity will be very helpful when thinking about innovation. But this is what I want you to know. Uh, when I chair the Committee on Underrepresentation, this is what we learned. Only 5% of Americans have degrees in STEM. 25 years. Only 5%. In Europe, it's almost 11%. India is in the process of creating 800 additional universities. Did you get that? 800 additional universities, okay? Why am I telling you that? The fact is that most Americans don't understand why STEM is so important. Now, the other thing I should say, though, is when I talk about STEM, it should not suggest that the arts, humanities, and social sciences are not important. They are very important. They're more important than ever before. More important than ever before. And um, it was Jim Collins who said, we should think not about the tyranny of the or, but the genius of the and. The genius of the and. It's not STEM or humanities. It should be STEM and humanities. You want your kids to learn across disciplines, to have options. You know, I love that when Paul was telling me his, his oldest son literally was looking at philosophy did some of that, which is wonderful, went into computing, and now works with Accenture and Google out in the Valley. It's great. He can give me a big check soon. All right, remember that, right? You tell him I said that. But the fact, you got, <laughs> after you get yours. But the fact is, to have that breath is, is very important. But here's the question. What percent of Americans do you think who begin with a major in science or engineering at the bachelor's level actually graduate with a degree in science or engineering? What do you think? I heard 25%, I heard a third, and 50. I will break, and again, we break everything down into different groups. Now, for women, the biggest issue is there's been a major decline in computer science. We have gone from 36% of the computer science majors being women, American, in uh, the 80s, 
So we thought by now we'd be half and half. We're down to 18%. So two reasons for it. One, uh, in, in that 80s and through the early 90s, we were doing more with girls in technology in K-12. But by the early 90s, because we'd gotten up to 30-some percent, people said, well, we've solved this problem. They didn't realize you don't solve a century-long problem in a 10-year period because of attitudes, you see. And so as soon as the schools stopped focusing on it and universities were, the numbers started going down. So now when a young woman goes into a computer science class, if there are 40 in the class, uh, she may see three or four. And the guys will look at her as if to say, well, I wonder why she's here. Because if you've not seen a lot of women in it, you just assume it's not the case. When we do the hackathons in Maryland, I was speaking to a hackathon, and there were, uh, there were 25 teams of four, there were 100 people, and I said to the guys, I said, um, uh, it's a great group, and I'm so impressed by you, but there's a challenge. What's the problem in the room right now? And uh, they said, what do you mean problem? It looks fine to us, and, all right? And, and finally, I said, um, what do I mean when I say one half the population is not represented? And they kind of looked, they were thinking about it, and then one person said, oh, you mean girls? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think they're the other half. And then a kid said very comfortably, oh, they're just not good at this. Didn't, wasn't embarrassed. And I said, well, how do you know they're not good at this? He said, well, you don't see them here, do you? All right. So the challenge we face is that if you don't see people now, I didn't even get them at that point. I said, well, what about the fact that there's nobody from an underrepresented group in STEM? They said, well, what does that mean? I said, somebody who looks like me, that there's nobody in the room but me, all right? There's no Hispanic in the room, no black in the room. It was all white and a few Asian kids, and that was it, boys, all right? Nice kids, but they were the victim of their circumstance, meaning what? They just hadn't seen it. If you haven't seen something, you just assume it's not the case. So all of my research focuses on underrepresentation. You might say, well, why is that important? Well, when I chaired the Obama Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans, I got all this data, but I wanted it on everybody. And let me just tell you what I found. There's not one national agency in America that could tell me that even 1% of its scientists were black. Even, even the Health Disparities Institute not even one, even the Drug and Alcohol Abuse Institute. And, you know, and a wonderful Latina who directs it said, walk around with me. See if you see people like she was Mexican-American. See if we see people who look like you or me anywhere. And they were not there. So in terms of innovation, we've made progress in increasing the number of people who go to college. We're up to at least a third. The big problem with college in general is that in the 60s, only 10% of kids in the bottom quarter of any race of low-income kids, only 10% only were graduating from college in six or seven years. What percent do you think today of poor children or children from low-income backgrounds of any race, what percent do you think graduate from college? Still 10% uh, under, okay? So we're the only industrialized nation that talks about democracy for all where poor children are not destined in any numbers to graduate from college. That's too awful. So that's, I mean, that's one of our challenges. When we think about innovation, surely we can use brain power to figure out what we can do to give support to families to make sure more are finished. And then similarly, uh, if you are spending billions of dollars on health disparities, and the health disparities have to do with kids from low-income backgrounds and of color, and there's nobody from those groups helping to solve the problems, then you're not really getting to the root because you don't have people who can even speak to the issues. Those are the kinds of challenges we face. And then NSA to me is the most enlightened of all in the sense that they really have been working hard to get more women and people from different kinds of racial and ethnic backgrounds into the work because they get the point that to have the richest problem solving, they need people from all types of backgrounds. So they will even say to me, yeah, we want some black kids, but not just black kids with parents from other countries. Did you get that? Because my kid who is, whose parents are from Jamaica will think very differently from a kid whose parents are from Bel Air, Maryland. All right? The kid from Jamaica or a parent will be much more British. 
in orientation. And, and that is fine. It's just that you've got other kinds of attitudes and ways of solving problems. And so what we've worked to do on campus is to bring in more programs that focus on helping students of all backgrounds, whether they're low income, from another country, from this country, women, people of color, in these areas where so many Americans don't do well, and to celebrate that work. And what I would say to you that makes the difference, two or three things. Number one, we tend to think, um, how many of you had a major in math or science? Let me see your hands. What you know is that if you tell somebody you had a major in physics or in chemistry or math, first thing somebody's going to say to you, whether you're mad or not, oh, you must be smart. We think that way, all right? Okay, think about it, okay? Uh, and uh, we at UMBC are saying we need to get away from the word smart. Because if I tell you, here's the smart group, if I say, here's the smart group here, okay? What am I saying about you all over here? Think about it, right? We, now, we educators are supposed to know about neuroscience and about child behavior and what else. But if I say, here's the smart group, congratulations, then I've just told you you're not smart, right? So there's something wrong even with the word smart. I would argue, and what we say at UMBC, the, uh, the, my UMBC alumni know this, uh, the dog on campus, the Chesapeake Bay Retriever, is a statue. And breath, I should tell you, before you take a final, you rub his nose. Get it shiny, right? You get it. It's a big joke we all tell. But his name is True Grit. And we say UMBC is the house of grit. Now, for us, innovation means changing the way people think about who's smart and who's not, questioning the meaning of the word smart, and rather thinking about who can succeed and achieve at the highest level. And we would argue it is the person with the grit. And how do you define that grit? It's the hard work. It's the resilience, it's never giving up, and it's believing if I keep working at it, I can figure it out. Oh, and it's also for us working in groups. One of the challenges in STEM is that it tends to be cutthroat in many places. We have really focused on collaborative approaches so that we have more students who succeed. How many of you went to college and somebody said, look at the student to your left, look at the student to your right, one of you will not graduate. Remember that, remember that, right? That's a terrible thing to say to some young person. Because if I'm at all immature, and we know the boys are a little less mature than the girls, we do know that usually, right? Then I'm thinking, oh my God, he just told me I'm not going to graduate. I may as well part of this year because I'm out of here anyway next year. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, so what we say is look at the student to your left, look at the student to your right. Our goal is to make sure all three of you graduate. And if you don't, we fail, and we don't plan to fail. Give us a big round of applause for that. It's idea. Give me a round of applause for that idea. Very important. Very important to understand that that we've got to change, and innovation would mean institutions stopping saying, well, we just throw them in there and let them sink or swim. But rather, we're here to work with them and with their parents. We tend to think in our country that when you're 18 years old or 17 and you go to college, you're an adult. You're not an adult. And most of the, even the big guys are still talking to their mothers because the mother's calling to check on them. We know if you've got parents, you know, I mean, if you have kids, you know what I'm saying. They need that support. So innovation should mean much more nurturing as much as the rigor, how much nurturing to move them to that level. So we have really worked to, to help students remain in those disciplines because if you think about it, if only a third of the kids who make it and study science make it, you never have enough people to do the jobs we have in our society, but also you've got a lot of students who don't feel good about science. And when I'm talking to people at NIH, and they're saying, why isn't Congress supporting what we're doing? I can say, well, even high achievers who started off in science got pushed out of it. Why should they want to vote or get Congress to vote for science? So we know if we're to be innovative in our universities and in K-12, we're going to have to give people a better experience whether they go on to become scientists or not. I'll tell you one counterintuitive stat. Um, the, the higher achieving the student is on tests, fives on AP and uh, AB and BC. I wrote those questions for the AB and BC calculus. They're formulaic, okay? It's minimum level math, although in high school you think of it as big time. Mi those who get the fives, those who have near perfect math scores, and that's my top quarter would be like that. Fact is that at most universities, and if they then go on to the most socially prestigious universities, they tend to be in the East. Northeast and private and $70,000 a year or out in certain places, the probability of graduating in STEM 
is the lowest of all. All the kids, people say, oh, wow, they're going off to an Ivy to major in science. They become great lawyers. I say it teasingly, but it's true. It really is. I said that at NIH, and one of the really fine lawyers that came up to me, she said, you just told my story. I had a perfect SAT. I had fives on everything. I started off in chemistry. I got a C in that, and of course, an A in literature. I went home and told my parents I love humanities. And it happens all the time. There's nothing wrong with the humanities, but if you started off wanting to be a chemist or an engineer, it's a shame that we, and we don't realize, and it's the American secret, because nobody's going to come back saying, I bombed out. They just say, I changed my major, right? And, but there's a feeling on the face when you talk. I see it all the time among some of the most esteemed professionals, and the look says, yeah, I didn't make it either. So I'm saying to the scientific community, we have to find ways, spirit of innovation, of stopping thinking only a few can survive in science and engineering. And you, you've got to be smart to make it in science. You've got to work your butt off. Whatever it is, you've got And I say that in the way of the students to make that point. It takes a lot. It's really silly when people act like, oh, I didn't have to work and I just got an A. You're right. When you get to upper level work, it takes that kind of effort. I, I want to leave you with a, with a, a comment about a a Nobel laureate in physics, and then we can talk. Um, it was I. I. Robbie, the Nobel laureate in physics in the 40s, who said when he was growing up in New York, all of his friends' mothers would say to them at the end of a school day, what did you learn in school? He said, but not my Jewish mother. He said, my mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And the practice of encouraging his curiosity made him the thinker he became. I want to challenge all of you in the spirit of innovation to ask good questions. I don't care how ridiculous they might sound, because it's that questioning that creates an environment that encourages people right, to think beyond what we thought was expected. Thank you all very much. Okay. Questions? So let's get some good questions. Let me hear some, some good questions, including some risky questions. So, yes? No, I do not. It's a great question. I do not believe every child should go to college. Years ago, I would have said something different, that every child should have the opportunity and should try it. Uh, and then um, Jobs for the Future, if you've not looked at them, Google it. Jobs for the Future is one of the big national efforts for the last couple of decades, looking at post-secondary opportunities. They've been successful in getting us all to think about post-secondary opportunities, meaning uh, not the traditional four-year college for everybody, but no, there are many opportunities that involve certificate programs, the AA programs in different areas, a combination of, of uh, internships and apprenticeship programs. I, one of the reasons uh, I, I've done a lot with people in other countries, um, I was a part of a leadership group on competitiveness between Germany and Japan and America 20 years ago. And, um, we looked at the apprenticeship programs in Germany. I was in Stuttgart, von Bernburg, and also in Japan uh, in the Kanagawa Prefecture in Yokohama. And uh, I proposed that we test the apprenticeship kids in chemistry who were going to the, the chemistry, the chemical companies, white coats on with their teacher several times a week. To, and these were the people who were not university bound, okay? So I wanted to test their level of chemistry at the end of the year against our students who had gotten fives on AP chemistry. The Germans did much better than our very best. Why? Because chemistry for them was not a test where you get an A. It was their way of life. They were getting paid. They were incentives. They saw it, and so they didn't just try to cram it in to get the A. They were trying to really learn it. And my point is that sometimes the hands-on approach leads to much deeper learning and understanding than we can imagine. The best um, math I've seen for um, kids who are trying to get a GED, people who are trying to get a GED, quite frankly, uh, was in South Central LA when they were building, a, uh, it was green construction, they were building a house. They were using the Pythagorean theorem, didn't even know what's called that. And by the time they got to the, they were in good shape. They really were. And they had skills. They didn't realize they were scared of math, and yet they had the kinds of skills they could get jobs in construction. I was speaking at school you all would know John Carroll uh, several years ago, two years ago. 
And, and this is an advantage school. It's a wonderful school. And a young man got up and he said, Dr. Bowski, I want you to tell me the truth. And everybody laughed. And his parents were in, a lot of parents were there. And he said just that. He said, I'm bored in school. I make A's and B's. I hate it. No offense to the teachers, he said. He said, I don't want to go to college. My parents are saying, I've got to go to college. Must I go to college? Now the parents are looking at me. <laughs> right, right now, right now. Oh, my God. Wait, wait a minute. So I said, well, what, do you, what we need to do first is to understand what the child is saying. I said, what, what, is, what do you want to do? He said, I want to be in construction. So I said, let me propose this. I said, your parents may not like this, but I'm going to propose this that you get into one of the construction management programs at a community college, which will allow you to be involved in construction right now while you're getting that double A degree. Uh, but you'll be learning a lot uh, because I believe once you get that, you're going to be so good, you'll want to get a bachelor's in business or in construction management and become the manager. You're going to like, you like the hands on, but you like being outside and you can combine all those things. But I think that will be better for you because then you'll be excited about it. Learning occurs when people are, they don't, it doesn't occur when you just make somebody do something. They do it to pass the test. I mean, I'm learning French right now. Most Americans take uh, a, a language because they have to, and they can't speak five sentences because they really want to do it. My femme et moi, nous étudions le français, mais non. Nous avons passé du temps pour Paris, plusieurs étudiants dans le français, pas français currently. I mean, I'm studying French every day because I want it. I'm working with some countries where you got a university that speaks French, but it's because I wanted to do it. And I was also inspired because my students said when they heard this about a year ago, they said, don't you think you're too old to learn that? Right? <laughs> that was all I needed. That's all I needed. Je parle français. All right. <laughs> Somebody else? Questions? Yes. 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 That's excellent. Excellent question. Number one, uh, the first response from all of the people on, on the commission that I chaired, and these were people from Harvard and MIT to Howard University to the University of Texas at Paso to Miami-Dade Community College, all types of people from all races, all kinds of institutions. And they said, well, the reason everybody's changing their majors, the reason two-thirds of Americans don't go past the first year of science or engineering is that uh, they don't have the background. It's a K-12 problem. That's what we all, in universities, we always blame K-12. Now, there are issues in K-12. However, this is what's interesting. The universities blame the high schools. The high schools blame the elementary schools. The elementary schools blame the families, and the husband says it's the wife's part of the family. That was the problem. <laughs> we all blame somebody else when the fact is we should be looking in the mirror to say, yeah, there are some K-12 problems, but one of the people in the commission was really good. He said, okay, well, we realized some people didn't get the math and science background, but what about the students who had fives on AP exams in math and science and near-perfect scores? who went to all those, you hear me saying socially prestigious, we confuse social prestige and academic quality. Um, academic quality should have to do with the rigor and the ability of any institution to help a student reach his or her goals and to go on from there and do quite well, quite frankly. It should not be about wanting to have somebody's catalog on the coffee table because you say they went to this place. And yet, we Americans always are saying, oh, it's so expensive to go to college. Yeah, if you're going to a very, very wealthy place, yeah, it is. It's three times as much. And if you got that money, you want to do that, fine. Except I would argue that even for people who have the money, look and see if your child is getting what you thought they were going to get and whether they reached the goal. If the child went there to be a doctor or to be a scientist or engineer and they're not making it, what's the quality? That's the question. We tend to say, well, it's the student's fault. No, it has to do with this. We, please, if you haven't looked at my TED Talk, it's, it's on changing the culture of science. It's only 15 minutes, and it either upsets people or they say, and this is, it's been, I mean, like 25 countries, it turns out other countries say the same thing. Most people say, yeah, you're right. They, they really didn't expect me to succeed. It's the, what do we call the first year of science and engineering in America? What's the word? Weed out courses. We just accept that idea. And what people say is, well, they just weren't smart enough to make it. Well, what do you do about it, okay? This is where our chemistry discovery center and redesigning courses. The fact is, the question is this. If I, if I give a test 
in whatever, in calculus. And uh, I've been putting stuff on the board, and I'm an eloquent speaker, and I know my material. And 80% of the students get below a C on the test. The ineluctable question is, did I teach it? Obviously not. We tend to think that if I put it on the board, if I presented it and you didn't get it, then you just didn't learn it. But the, the question we should be asking is, did I teach it? You, do, you don't teach something if somebody doesn't learn it, doesn't grasp it, right? And because if you don't think that way, then people get a D and you just keep it. And what we do right now in most classes, 80% get Ds. And what, what's the next thing the teacher does? It goes on to the next section. And if you're in STEM, you know this. One thing, like languages, one thing builds on another. I can't do uh, un parfait tense. If I, I do that before I do plus parfait. I mean, one tense builds on another. One level of French or any language was the same thing in math and science. Who could do longhand division if they hadn't first learned subtraction and multiplication? So what we do in this country is we, we supposedly teach multiplication and subtraction, 80% still didn't get it, but we've got to go into division because we've got to finish the course. You get my point? And so you got people all the way back here still with the basic level not getting it, and you're moving on. And so what do we do? It's about being much more flexible, which is a word you use here between talking about innovation. It means this. If half the class failed the midterm, that even though you've got to move on to other sections, there should be supplemental time when students are going back to figure out what they didn't learn and to have either teacher or students working with them. So we use technology a lot, which, you know, if, if there's a certain concept somebody hadn't gotten, you can always use everything from the Khan Academy work to others to say, you've got to work on this. We actually had what we call for a good while, something called a math gym. And we're having this fight now whether it should be called math lab or math gym. Math gym, I like because it says, you go to the gym not because you're already in perfect shape, but you know you got to build up your muscles. You got to build up your stamina. It's the idea of mindset that I may not have it right now. I may not be able to lift 25 pounds now, but with time I can. We learn to do by doing. And so it's the question of rethinking the teaching and learning process. That's the answer. Course redesign, collaborative learning. Uh, most students who are high achieving in high school are not accustomed to getting help from anybody. I don't know anybody, I don't care what level, who doesn't need help at some point. My youngest freshman ever at UMBC was nine years old. I have a young, I went through school early, so I'm always trying to help kids who go through early. And um, what's interesting is I'll get kids through the calculus sequence by the time they're 13. Large, of all races, boys and girls. Why? Because some kids are bored in school. Okay, and they need more. And you really can go through it if you've got the algebra background, you can go through calculus. Why am I saying that? Even with those children who've come to us from the Center for Talented Youth at Hopkins, even with those children, the number one characteristic, they work really hard. It's not like it's just you just sit there. No, they work really hard. And they've had caring parents who work with them. I want them to give them support so they can develop what? Emotional intelligence. When a kid is that high achieving, they really need the emo. The reason Malcolm um, Gladwell in his book says that geniuses don't do any better than anybody else is they don't know how to play in the, in the sandbox. So it's the balancing of, it's not just learning the concepts, how do you work with other people? It's all of that that gets into it. Okay. Next question. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, yes. So what did you do? When you got the D, what did you do then? Did you retake the course? Okay. But let me ask this question. If you got a D, when did you learn the material that you clearly didn't know? When did you do that? 
did you go back and work on? I'm trying to get you to analyze what did you do? That because the, the analytics, we now use, that's another part of innovation for us that companies have used for a long time. We now do analytics to look and say, okay, of the students who earn Ds in the first semester, what happens the next semester? Fact is, 80% won't get above a D the second semester. You, you had improved. Were you studying the first? Let me ask you that. Let's start here. When you were said, were you studying? There's the question. How much time were you putting in? <laughs> well, well, you brought it up. So <laughs> what do you think? Enough time in. And, and it's, it's how you study, and it's the amount of time you study. I would say it's also whether you're working with other people. You can work six hours by yourself and never get any better if you don't, you know, if you don't know how to do it, right? That's why we really put a lot of emphasis on collaboration. We actually use Blackboard to give students a chance to, to determine, okay, if they're studying with other people, if they're working in groups outside of class, and then to look at their test scores, and then to compare. And what, they, what really upsets them is this, and this is all in real time, using the technology. Students will say to me, it's not fair that their grade is higher than mine just because they work with other people and they put in more hours. That's not fair. Because I worked harder than I ever worked, and I should have an A. Okay? Now, this kid may have worked two hours. He sees these other people putting in four hours per day and working with other people. But to him, it wasn't fair because he was working harder than he ever worked. You get my point? So the idea of how realistic people are about what it takes to succeed, very important. And it could be because from high school to college, depending on your high school, if it's not a science and tech school, you don't have to work hard to get an A. I have kids who will say, well, I, I didn't have to work at all. I just, and so they believe that you can get A's just for being there in the class. I should be able just to hear, it's the teacher's fault. She, you, you get my point? So somehow being realistic about what it takes to succeed, very important. But now we would say people who do better tend to work in groups. And quite frankly, a lot of people don't want to admit it. It has been the influence of the Asian population at Berkeley to other places that has led to more group work. We've seen what group work does. When blacks and whites get together for years, they've partied. They've done other things. They've not worked together. We don't think that way generally. Now we're doing it much more. But for, for the Asian population, you see them working in a group. The research has shown that over and over again. And it makes a big difference. It really does. Uh -huh. Yes. Now that was enlightened. That was enlightened. When you got to college, you thought you didn't need that help. Mm -hmm. So it showed you more about your lack of wisdom than anything else. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I appreciate your being. See, one of the things that we do at UMBC that is unusual is to get students to be willing to encourage them to talk about that poor performance. At most places, uh, when you ask any freshman how you do it, that student's going to say, I'm OK. I mean, as, if you think back to your college careers, people don't talk about grades. The most they'll say is, I'm OK. Now, they may have gotten Ds and Fs on everything, but I'm OK because they've never made below a C or B in high school, and they think, well, I'm in this class, so of course they're going to give me at least a B. I mean, there are school systems in Maryland that will give kids a B in calculus just because they're taking the course. And they're thinking that that means, quite frankly, that they're ready for the next calculus course. So it's the realism. It's an excellent point. Next question, next question. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yeah, it's an excellent. Yes. Right. right. Well, you know, places like you think of NIH is one of the biggest enterprises, and they're they are really working. They're putting more and more money into efforts to bring in more people. Because you do see the teams in labs working at all the institutes. You know, all of the NIH institutes are in Maryland, with the exception of NIEHS. Environmental Health is down at Duke and Chapel Hill. But everything else is here. And if you go, you'll see a lot of group work. And then the grants they give focus on that. They even 
The policies right now go, say exactly what you just said. And when, when people get grants, they want to know how much are you bringing in people from all kinds of backgrounds? How do you have a team approach? Right? What are you learning from that? So we, we've begun to do the to make the policies work. The two issues would be, number one, it is a K-12 problem for a lot of kids who are from poor backgrounds and if they're not from a solid school. The difference between going to a school in Montgomery County in general or in Howard County, Cent Centennial or Singapore, in Howard County, the schools are so good that the scores are above those in Singapore, okay? Now, while the school's so good, you got a lot of scientist kids in those schools. It's the wealthiest county in the state, right? Uh, and you got a lot of people, even with PhDs, teaching the classes. You got all that going on. So it's the wealth and it's the family because family makes a difference. If you, I don't care whether a mother and father have an education or not, if they make sure the kid works on homework at night, that kid's gonna be better off. You know, uh, if there's an attitude that says we have a responsibility, the worst thing an American family can do is to say it's all the teacher's fault, as opposed to saying, how can I work with the teacher to help my child to read? I mean, can you imagine there are many American families when a kid can't read who will say it's the teacher's fault? You know, and this is educated families, right? And so, I mean, the idea of starting there, getting kids of all backgrounds doing better in the early years, is the first challenge. And where we've finally learned, the biggest piece of innovation for me in education in the last few years is that now you'll hear every neuroscientist saying that that baby, I mean, from the, from the wound to K is probably the most important part of a child's life in terms of development of the brain. I mean, people now get that, that early childhood is not just about colors or just about something that's frivolous, that children acquire language skills and thinking skills in the first five years of life. And one of the problems with poverty is if that child is, the child has so, doesn't develop the language skills, doesn't have the vocabulary, and is not around somebody who's encouraging the, the, the questioning. Because what you hear from poor families is somebody telling the child to shut up. I mean, children start off very naturally curious. Educated people will encourage the curiosity, and that's what we've got to teach every mother and father. I mean, the idea of encouraging it so you can have that kind of um, inquisitiveness from the beginning. And for me, as a mathematician, reading skills. If you think about it, to do chemistry problems, physics problems, engineering problems, accounting problems, you need strong reading skills. If you give me a girl who can read, I can teach her to solve the math word problem. Because I want to give you, in the spirit of innovation, a math problem, by the way, that I'm not going to solve for you. And what's exciting about it is even the PhDs will have a little difficulty. It's one I give all over the world to CEOs, to scientists. Here it goes. Um, 29 kids. I get goosebumps, by the way, in math. Goosebumps, OK? How many of you love math? Let me see your hands. That's a pretty nerdy group. Not bad. It's about 30%. At UMBC, everybody knows math rocks. I mean, we, I mean, you, you, yeah, you see somebody in math, you go, mm, like that, right? Uh, and by the way, we are the national cybersecurity champions this year. Big round of applause. A big round of applause. Because if I had said we had won the final four in basketball, you'd be giving me a standing ovation. Wait a minute. You know, trying to get Americans to understand what's important, right? But okay, here's the problem. 29, now do not haul out an answer. If you do, you owe me $10, okay? Because uh, Americans want that answer. 29 kids are in a class, 20 have dogs, 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? I'll say it again, 29 kids are in a class, 20 have dogs, 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? Now watch this. There are three groups in this room right now. There are those who always got A's in math, they're dying to get the answer. They're either kind of writing down or they've got this look on their face. I want this answer. I want this answer. There are those on the other side who've never been too comfortable with math who are saying, why would he do us like this? Why is he asking us something like that? And then the, most of you are in the middle of the fence. Well, I might try, but I don't think I can get it. Right, right. And, and what you're really saying is, God, I hope he doesn't call on me. All right? <laughs> That's what, those are the same three groups you have in any classroom. Now, watch this. Suppose I told you that if somebody can get up with confidence, and give me not only the answer, but it help me understand how you teach it to a 12-year-old without giving that 12-year-old the answer. If you can do that right now, I will give you $1,000. Can you all take money from people? 
You know, some some agencies. I just thought about it. I, this is on tape. I don't want to go. I don't want to go to jail. I am not bribing you. I am not. Let the record show. I am not bribing you. I don't think you're one of those places. I think it's okay, right? So I mean, like a get like a prize, right? So, is there anybody? Raise your hand if you're willing to go out on a limb. And now uh, I'm going to say this: If you're wrong, you owe me five hundred dollars. But, I, I just, but, but notice the level of interest going up when I said the $1,000, right? What am I saying in the spirit of innovation? In classrooms, I tell teachers this all the time, you got to have something that gets kids to go, whoa! You know, sometimes when, because I mean, in any given time, you know your own children. They may be excited, but they may be bored. Got to have something kooky to get kids, I mean, think about it, what it takes for double. Think about it for kids. If you don't do something that's not boring, they just say, oh, God, here we go with school again. So a part of innovation for anybody has to be some way of getting them to go, whoa, maybe, maybe I want to do this, right? And we in education tend to be so stuffy, we miss the point that sometimes throwing in something like that, even though I don't have $1,000, I at least had you thinking I did, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Any, is there anybody who would, I'm not going to have you do it, but raise your hand if you think you have the answer. This is a truly risk adverse group, except for my one. I, I mean, I want you all to take a risk adverse test. You all are going to, I see one or two. Now, you're going to ask me a great question, aren't you? Okay. As long as you're not going to try to give me the answer, right? It's a, it's a brilliant question. It really is a brilliant question. And I would say they are inextricably linked. In order to teach someone how to go through the process, one needs to have the confidence that one could do it him or herself, okay? But uh, your question, it's exactly the question. Because here's the problem, and I, I just gave, last year I gave a talk to all the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, and I said this, and they were, they were a little insulted, and then I did the same thing for the National Science Group last week. Uh, I said this, the problem with math in America is that K through eight teachers don't have a math major, and they certainly don't, they don't even have a, a, a year of calculus. And if you're going to teach algebra well, you need at least a year of calculus, okay? And, and, and the math for elementary school teachers in America, those courses are less difficult than algebra one. The methods courses. So the people who are good teachers in K through eight just happen to have been good in math in high school. And you get my point. So a lot of the independent schools, I was at Friends last night. Some of those teachers will be, quite frankly, people who were just good in high school or they took some math. Now, at the better schools, you've got people with grad degrees in physics and math. I mean, you, you know, but for most American schools, the person is afraid of math herself, okay? The second point is this. Even when I can solve it, if I don't have a deep enough background, I know how to solve it one way. And the, the biggest fear I have is that I have one of you as a parent. Because if you have a background in math and science or engineering, you're going to solve it one way. The kid goes and says, well, my mom said this, my dad. And the teacher's going, no, that's not how you do it. Because they don't know. They don't know the other ways of solving the problem. You get my point? And so you, you're absolutely right. So what, what I'm saying is we need teachers who have deeper knowledge and who have the chance to see how you solve it in different ways because children and people are different in solving problems. A kid who comes out of a very privileged background may take one approach. Somebody who's from a rough background who's, right, is another. I mean, the point I got in all of my abstract algebra work from grad school was this. They would always say, I, I was able to solve the proof, but I was never elegant in the approach. That word of elegance, right? Elegant and simple approach. I'm just, uh, I'm just getting it all in there, getting it all in there so I can say QED, right? And all the European professors always said, lacking elegance. That was what, <laughs> and I'm saying, yeah, but I got it. Wait a minute. Uh, but good questions, very good questions. Somebody else, last question. Yes, uh-huh. That was a great one. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's an excellent question. There's several things I would say. I do think you're much too risk adverse. 
I'm very serious about that. You're, you're not accustomed just to being relaxed enough. I mean, so working on the environment, because if you're not, when others come in, they're going to be just like you. I mean, they're not going to feel comfortable. And that, it's not a big thing, but it's a tweaking. It is a tweaking, I think, to work on something that gets, gets people to try different approaches at whatever. It's the only way you're going to be able to really think about getting out of the box. But, but larger than that, you are a very rare group of Americans in that you have an appreciation of what STEM does for the world. I, I hope you are involved in schools in your communities. Teachers rarely know how math and science relate to the real world. And it's not enough to say, well, it's about something over in that lab over there, right? We, we've got to bring the STEM to life. And the kind of work you do is so noble and so protective of this country. People need to appreciate this is as noble as, and it is about humanity. It really is. And I think having a chance to talk in classes, but also more than half of Maryland's children did not come up to the level of proficiency in mathematics or reading on the test that just came out the results in every county. And if they're from low income, it's like 80% didn't make it, OK? So and this is for third and fourth grade. You know, having a, a North of Grumman is a great example of enlightenment. North of Grumman uh, has worked with us with Lakeland Elementary in the city. And the engineers come in. It's a STEAM center. They do something. We do some things in the arts also. But they are helping us with our future teachers in working on the math problems with the children, but let me say this, the teachers are learning a lot because they're learning different ways of solving those problems. You get what I'm saying? And the teachers deserve to understand different approaches they can use. Everybody in here took geometry. I'll close with this. Everybody in here took geometry. And you remember when you started doing those statements and reasons and proving you're trying to figure out what is this all about? And the, the typical question from somebody will be to the teacher, why, why am I doing this? Why am I studying geometry? And we math teachers have been taught to say, you're studying this to learn how to think. OK, that's what we've been taught to say. And the kid is thinking, I know how to think. I think this sucks is what I think. <laughs> I challenge you to help kids not to think math and science suck. Thank you all very much, all right? <laughs>